Well, good afternoon on this Good Shepherd Sunday. Prayers and blessings to all of our parishioners in Medford and Jacksonville. It's ironic that as we reflect on the Good Shepherd, um, and I'm trying to be a Good Shepherd myself, but I'm here alone. <laughs> uh, something wrong with the, the shepherd and the flock being separated, but we know our real shepherd is the Lord and he's with us in our time of crisis. And uh, we join together in prayer uh, and think of one another on a day like today. I want to just leave you though with a few more spiritual thoughts to ponder a little food for this weekend. So I wanna begin by reading the gospel message for this Good Shepherd Sunday, year A. It comes from John's gospel from chapter 10, verse one through 10. Jesus said, amen, amen, I say to you, whoever does not enter a sheepfold through the gate, but climbs over elsewhere is a thief and a robber. But whoever enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him and the sheep hear his voice as the shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has driven out all his own, he walks ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they recognize his voice, but they will not follow a stranger. They will run away from him because they do not recognize the voice of strangers. Although Jesus used this figure of speech, the Pharisees did not realize what he was trying to tell them. So Jesus said again, Amen, Amen, I say to you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. This uh, particular passage this year that we have to ponder in year A really puts added emphasis on listening, on striving to recognize the voice of our Good Shepherd. And this morning at Mass, I shared an image that stuck to me from my time in Astoria. I shared with the people of Astoria that I, I used to have a fond hobby of watching the Nature Channel. There's so many amazing creatures and to see how different ecosystems on planet Earth function in harmony to me is a kind of spiritual experience, or it certainly can be if you are mindful of the Creator and you see his fingerprint on creation. And I shared at one point as I was going through the Planet Earth series that for me it was an epiphany. It was another way of glimpsing our God. And I thought to myself, if God's truth and beauty and goodness is reflected in divine revelation, it certainly also is present there in nature if we have the eyes to see. And uh, TV series like that helped us to recognize that. So I started a little preaching series for a time. It lasted maybe about two months in which I selected various plants and animals, creations of God, uh, to point out things that they can teach us from God, from the Creator. And on this particular day, as I think of listening, there was one of those stories that came to mind for me. I can't remember now the particular species of penguin, but there was uh, a snapshot in the life and times of one particular penguin who had a, a very brutal existence. They actually swam, I think, thousands of miles, literally, to their nesting area up north. And this particular species of penguin uh, gathered together in one spot, there were over 2 million birds. And they showed how these particular penguins partnered up as mates and how they shared the duty of keeping the egg warm. They would have one egg between the mating pair and the male and female would take turns sitting on the egg. But in this particular case, with this 
species of penguin. They chose a very difficult nesting area. It was on a cliff and their life could be described in this way. Uh, one bird would return from the ocean with food. Immediately, the other would depart for the ocean. And it showed how this penguin had to crawl with its short little legs down the cliff, down this very difficult climb to the shore. And they would swim out to the ocean about two miles, just looking for uh, little fish they could capture uh, to carry in their gullet back to the nest for this for the hatchlings to eat and uh, in doing that they had to swim past a number of predators uh, killer whales and other sea creatures sea lions and different things that were uh, hunting them and, and trying to eat them and they would spend half a day uh, their hunting trip took about 12 hours they would get back in time to make that long arduous climb back up the cliff but the most amazing part that stood out to me was the end. When they got back to the giant flock of uh, penguins and they're all squawking, they're all making this immense noise. Uh, this, the scientist who was narrating the scene said that this particular type of penguin had one of the keenest sense of hearing that they've ever measured on an animal because they were able to distinctly recognize the one squawk out of two million that was their mate. And that's how they found their way back to their nest. And they would feed the young who had by that time hatched, uh, you know, fill its stomach and they would take the turn sitting over the bird to keep it warm. And the other mate would set out on that same journey. And sometimes they didn't come back, but it struck me how amazing it was that they could recognize one voice out of two million, which sounded to me like noise. That particular image moved one of the parishioners so much that she went out and got a picture of this penguin and had it framed and gave it to me as a gift. So uh, when I was in Astoria, that picture of the penguin was in my living room. But anyway, it's an example of how nature can teach us some of these uh, very valuable qualities. On a more ordinary level, though, I heard a story yesterday uh, about a guy. He said he grew up as a military brat. His dad was a soldier, and they moved from place to place as he took new assignments. And he remembered one particular place where they had a house next to a big city park. And he liked that one best because he could always go and play. And there were, you know, always 30 or 40 kids in the park and loud sounds of playing and shouting and laughing and he said you know despite all the play and the distraction uh, it didn't matter what time if his mother uh, stepped out of the house to the edge of the park and shouted out to him uh, and to let him know that lunch was ready he always heard it he could make that noise out in the midst of all the other chaos and he could recognize his name in particular so on a more ordinary level for us humans, uh, that's another image we can work with. But to be honest, as I shared this morning, uh, and as with just about everything in life now, unfortunately, much of my thinking is framed by this coronavirus crisis. So uh, in recent events, another layer of this challenge was added to my thinking uh, in the form of three distinctly different quotes. Now I'm assuming in charity, all of these three people are good people. They all love others. They all have concern for neighbor. They all have concern for our safety. And yet these three different quotes, which I've heard in the last 24 hours, they each paint a distinctly different picture. The first one came from a state governor who said, uh, an outbreak anywhere is an outbreak everywhere. Now that's a very global perspective and a very cautious perspective, but the idea, I guess, from that reflection is we'll never be able to return to life as we formerly knew it until we're all safe, until every country has this uh, illness stabilized. So there's one quote. And on the other hand, I heard this quote. If we wait until it's safe enough, safe enough means never. This was by a fellow who had led over 20 pilgrimages to Israel and he 
he used the analogy of asking friends to join him on the pilgrimage. And very often people would say, well, you know, I really want to go. It's on my bucket list for life, but I want to wait until it's safe enough to go travel to the Middle East. And he would always say to them, if you're waiting until it's safe enough, you'll never go. And he took that sentiment and applied it to our current situation and basically said, if we're waiting as a nation until it's safe enough, we will never resume life, uh, that there's inherent risk to living. That's also a quote from a good person, but it leads to a very different conclusion. And then a third one from someone who's not an elected leader, but just someone down in the trenches like you and I, a barbershop owner, I heard his quote. Uh, he said, and as he was battling, trying to reopen his business, he said, I understand that we are all in the same storm together, but I've come to realize that we're not in the same boat. He was trying to point out that those who are wealthier, who have more in savings, those who are able to work online or telecommute, they are not really experiencing the same level of suffering as he is, as he was describing burning through his family savings, being at risk of losing a decades old business that he'd worked hard to build up. Um, all three legitimate quotes all contain some elements of truth, all based on careful reflection of the situation we're in and all pointing to a slightly different take, a different perspective. It's for me, the takeaway anyway, is uh, when you add the layer of trying to discern truth in the voice that you're trying to hear, it makes it all that much more difficult. You know, we have a president who is urging us to return to life after April 30th. We have state governors in some cases who say we really shouldn't even try that until late summer or I heard one or two even say next year. Uh, and we have our own archbishop too who is taking the, the current state guidelines and even taking a more careful approach than the governor. When you try to sort that out, that's just based on a, a medical situation, a material challenge that we're facing. Try to apply that to our spiritual life, to the spiritual journey we're on. It's just all that more challenging. It makes me amazed sometimes that if God wanted us to find him, how did he make it so hard? He's that still small whisper in our heart that we have to search for and there are so many competing voices for spiritual truth today. Uh, as challenging as it is to try and navigate through this coronavirus crisis, it's many times more difficult trying to discern God's pathway uh, as we make our way through life and trying to find him. Trying to recognize the voice of the Good Shepherd may well be the greatest challenge of our life. Uh, what I've come to know what little I know of that search is that it's best done in prayer, it's best done in silence, and that Shepherd himself teaches us to recognize his voice. If we give him enough time, if we devote enough time in prayer, we do come to hear it like those amazing penguins with two million others quacking sounds. It can be recognized, and, and God invites us to do that. I think if we recognize that voice, even when we have confusion in our life and in the world, we can find peace in our hearts. That's my prayer for you this week on this Good Shepherd Sunday. Take some time today in silence to try and listen to that still, small whisper, the voice of our Good Shepherd. Uh, God bless you. And uh, we close with a little prayer. Hail Mary and full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.